In this presentation we're going to look at the design and performance of anaerobic ponds. These ponds have such a high organic loading or BOD loading that they do not contain any dissolved oxygen. They're usually quite deep, often two to four metres deep, and they contain no or very few algae, although we occasionally come across a thin surface film of Chlamydomonas, which is a sulphide resistant alga. The operation of anaerobic ponds is quite straightforward. The settleable solids settle out to form a sludge layer, and especially at temperatures above 15 degrees C, there is intense anaerobic digestion in the sludge layer, and a lot of biogas, methane and carbon dioxide, is produced. In warm climates, the removals of BOD and suspended solids are both very high, and in general terms, an anaerobic pond functions much like an open septic tank. Often around 30% of the influent BOD leaves the pond as biogas, CH4 and CO2. There are the same groups of anaerobic organisms in anaerobic ponds as in other anaerobic reactors like septic tanks and anaerobic digesters, and they require the same environmental conditions, such as a pH above 6.5. We design anaerobic ponds on the basis of volumetric BOD loading, lambda V, which is expressed in units of grams per cubic metre per day. So if Li is the influent BOD in milligrams per litre, which is the same as grams per cubic metre, Q is the flow in cubic metres per day, and V is the volume in cubic metres, then lambda V equals LIQ over V, or since V over Q is the mean hydraulic retention time, theta A, lambda V equals LI over theta A and the value of theta A should not be less than one day. The usual range of design values for lambda V on anaerobic ponds treating normal domestic and municipal wastewater is 100 to 400 grams per cubic metre per day. It's generally thought that if lambda V is less than 100, the pond won't be fully anaerobic, but I'm not sure if this is really true. And if lambda V is more than 400, then there's a risk of odour release. So we need to understand odour. It's mainly caused by H2S, and this comes from the reduction of sulphates by the obligately anaerobic sulphate-reducing bacteria, such as Desulfa vibrio species. These bacteria reduce sulphates to sulphides, and in aqueous solutions, sulphides are present as a mixture of dissolved H2S gas molecules, bisulphide ions, HS-, and sulphide ions, S-, and the proportion of these three forms depends on the pH as shown in this slide. We can see immediately that the sulphide ions only begin to appear at a pH of 8, and so we won't find them in an anaerobic pond. The two red lines are at pH 7 and pH 8, and anaerobic ponds usually have a pH between these two values. At pH 7, roughly half the total sulphide is present as H2S, and half as HS-, minus. but at pH 8, only around 10% is H2S, and 90% is HS-. Minus. The more H2S there is, the greater the risk of odour, because odour is caused by the H2S molecules that leave the pond through its surface as they seek to increase the partial pressure of H2S in the air above the pond, in other words, as they seek to obey Henry's law. Early work in the US showed that anaerobic ponds did not have an odour problem if the sulphate concentration in the raw wastewater was less than 500 mg sulphate per litre. This is quite high, especially as the maximum concentration permitted in drinking water is 250 mg sulphate per litre. Of course, the sulphate concentration in wastewater is higher than in drinking water, as detergents, for example, can contain up to 40% by weight of sodium sulphate. Control should not normally be necessary, but if it is required, you can add lime or soda ash to keep the pH above 7. As for the design of anaerobic ponds, we know that performance increases with temperature, but there are too few good quality field data to derive a satisfactory design equation relating lambda V with temperature. The design temperature we use is the mean temperature of the coldest month, and we generally adopt a minimum value for the retention time of one day. This table gives the design values of lambda V. These are 100 grams per cubic metre per day at 10 degrees and below, 200 at 15 degrees, 300 at 20 degrees, and 350 at 25 degrees, with linear interpolation in between. The BOD removals that we assume in our design are 40% at 10 degrees and below, 50% at 15 degrees, 60 at 20 degrees, and 70 at 25 degrees, 
again with linear interpolation in between. This is some work we did with anaerobic ponds in northeast Brazil some 25 years ago, when in fact it was the first work done on anaerobic ponds anywhere in the country. We had two anaerobic ponds in series, coded A2 and A3, and in parallel with these was another anaerobic pond, A4. The pond temperature was around 25 degrees throughout the year, and the loading on A3 was just over 300 grams per cubic metre per day, and on A4, just under 130 grams per cubic metre per day. These were the results. Pond A3, which had a retention time of 0.8 day, reduced the BOD from 245 milligrams per litre to 59 milligrams per litre. That's a removal of nearly 76%. The other ponds didn't perform as well, and the whole set of results from these and other anaerobic ponds at the same site looked like this. The percentage BOD removals are much of a muchness, and really, for this strength wastewater, there's no point in having a retention time longer than one day. Because anaerobic ponds have such good removals of BOD and suspended solids, incorporating them into a series of ponds has the effect of reducing the land area needed for the pond system. And so we should always use them, especially in warm climates. And we would only not use them at small systems, serving just a few thousand people. There are two special O&M requirements for anaerobic ponds. Firstly, you may need to spray the scum layer with a biodegradable larvicide if fly breeding becomes a nuisance. And secondly, the ponds need to be desludged regularly. They should never be allowed to be more than half full of sludge, and I prefer not to let them become more than a third full of sludge. An anaerobic pond becomes a third full of sludge after n years, where n is equal to a third of the pond volume in cubic metres, divided by the sludge accumulation rate in cubic metres per person per year and the population served. The value of the sludge accumulation rate is about 0.04 cubic metres per person per year in the tropics and about two to three times this value in temperate climates. This slide shows the effluent from a slaughterhouse in central Cyprus. It's a strong wastewater with a BOD of around 1,500 to 2,000 milligrams per litre. It's treated in two anaerobic ponds in parallel. These work very well, with BOD removals in excess of 80%, even in winter. This is Spain, a set of seven anaerobic ponds in parallel, in Murcia, just inland from the Costa Calida. There was a very strong smell of H2S, but this wasn't a problem until a motorway was built immediately adjacent to the ponds, and motorists started complaining about the smell. This silo structure was at the site. It contains liquid oxygen and was a so-called solution to the odour problem. What they did was to introduce oxygen into the ponds via the plastic tubing you can see on the left of the slide. And you can also see the lines of oxygen bubbles across the pond. However, this was a totally ineffective solution. So what was the source of the sulphate in the wastewater? It transpired that the local drinking water had a sulphate concentration way in excess of the maximum of 250 milligrams SO4 per litre permitted in the drinking water directive. In fact, it was around 600 to 1200 milligrams per litre. So the correct solution was to treat the drinking water. This had been successfully done in the next province when it had the same problem and the odour then disappeared. <laughs>